everyone that is gathering on Zoom, thank you so much for spending this afternoon hearing about the state of our school. So when one titles an address um, in that form, I guess the best thing to do is to try and answer that question. What is the state of this school? I would say uh, the state of our school is strong. Um, we have a really strong history and tradition of public health here at UC San Diego. For those of you who are new to the campus, you may not know this, but the Department of Community Medicine was actually established here at UC San Diego before the medical school was established, and that was in 1966. And it is that history of the community medicine department that ended up flowing into the School of Public Health. And so we have been around for a long time. We've been doing really great work for a long time. And we honor those traditions as we're thinking about what we're going to do for the future. Our current school state, I think, is vibrant. Um, we went through the various components of strategic planning where we started out with our why. Um, we went on to look at the what it is that we wanted to do. And then we talked about our how. And so this year, 2023, is the year of how do we get it all done? And I see a very engaged and enthusiastic community um, here to, uh, to, to work on the how with us. And then we have what I would say is a really bright future. So you'll hear as we um, talk today about the state of things in the school with regards to our education, our education mission, our research mission, and our um, public health practice mission that we, I think, are a, really a strong school because we've put things in place to make sure that we're going to do well. But I think what was going to make us a great school is knowing where our blind spots are, right? So really knowing what the potential threats are to this school now and in the future and preparing ourselves to meet those threats. And so for those reasons, I think the state of the school is strong. So we'll start there. Now, let me show you some real information. All right, so here um, is just a summary of you know, why it is that I think we're gonna do extremely well this year and in the years beyond. So we have established teaching programs that we brought with us from our prior configuration as a department in the School of Medicine, and they continue to be strong with strong leadership. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. We're also on a growth trajectory. And the position of growth is one that requires resources. Um, importantly, it requires human resources as well as you know capital resources and physical resources. And we are doing a good job in growing in each of those spaces. Our research portfolio, I have some really exciting things to share about that. It's independent and it's collaborative. We work in our, um, in our individual labs, but you'll see some motion toward working across labs. And even more so now structurally, we've created opportunities for people to do a lot of crosstalk. There's a willingness and an interest to serve. I cannot um, tell you how delighted it makes me to, um, to just know that we are a community of people who look outward. We know that the way to do public health isn't in the ivory tower. And as a school of public health, we're really called to do that work in community and the interest is here and the willingness is here. And then lastly, I would say that our two years of strategic planning have put us in a place where I firmly believe that we can be the youngest school of public health that is in the top 10 in the next 10 years. So let's take a sort of an at a glance look at our educational programs. And I'll start with the Bachelor of Science in Public Health. So we have uh, this year 658 declared majors in that program. We touch the lives of 2,900 students on this campus um, in a year. They come and they take our classes and we interact with them and mentor, advise, et cetera. And then we have an anticipated number of just over 230 students graduating this year. So this BSPH program continues to thrive and um, you'll see later on, it attracts a really um, it, it exciting group of people who are going to serve uh, public health in this region as well as beyond. The Master of Public Health program enrolls right now about 89 students, and we anticipate roughly 30 of those students graduating in June. 
We are uh, grateful to have our program be more visible nationally, and we're getting in students from you know our region as well as from uh, other parts of the country. And I think we're competing very nicely with um, our fellow MPH programs across the country. The joint doctoral program in public health uh, currently has 79 students enrolled in it. This is a program that we administer with San Diego State University. And we have three uh, different concentrations, global health, health behavior, and epidemiology. Our graduates this uh, year will be roughly five, and we have seen increased visibility, right? Over um, the last five, six years, uh, lots of students going to meetings, uh, conferences, convenings. We, of course, took a break from all of that during the years the, the, the earlier years of the pandemic, but now our students are starting once again to uh, get out. We recently had Alec Kalak, an MD PhD student, uh, present his data and findings at an international meeting in uh, Rome, which is really exciting. And then our biostatistics group administers two programs, the Master of Science in Biostatistics and the PhD program in Biostatistics. This has been an incredible uh, sense of growth over the last uh, couple of years. There are now 43 students enrolled. I remember days when we would sit and talk and it was just an idea to get uh, these biostatistics program off the ground. So uh, in 2022, the first full cohort of the MS students graduated, that was 11 of them and they're pursuing either advanced educational or other um, graduate school degrees or they're gainfully employed. Um, five PhD graduates have career positions in academia or in business. And exciting um, news just to show the rigor and the quality um, of, of the programming that we offer to our students. Our MS student, uh, Naomi Wilcox, who's expected to graduate this June, and the MS student graduate already, Tiana Truby, um, were awarded Julie D. Sue um, 80 master's degree scholarships. And so that's, again, a really nice signal that our students are competitive and they are uh, primed to do well. I have some exciting news um, to share with regards to uh, students and the way that we support our students. We recently received, um, after some advocacy on the part of our Associate Dean for Business Affairs, Randy Brooks and myself, um, with our ex ex executive leadership team, the Vice Chancellor and the Chancellor, $2 million that will get directed into our next four incoming cohorts of MPH students and MS uh, in biostatistics students. So you see the breakdown here for how those dollars will be invested across um, those four uh, incoming cohorts. You'll see there's a slightly larger investment in our MPH program, and that just reflects the expectations for the MPH to be a much larger cohort when it's in steady state, as well as there's a higher tuition rate. And so to compensate for that, um, we will need to invest a little bit more. So I want to just publicly thank our vice chancellor and our chancellor for, uh, for those funds. Our vice chancellor may actually be joining us by Zoom. So if you're here, VC Care Others, thank you so much. Another exciting um, development within our school is the establishment of our teaching divisions. And at the end of last calendar year, we talked about what these teaching divisions would be. However, now we have leadership for these teaching divisions and some of them are up and, and um, moving along. So they are established in biostatistics and bioinformatics and you'll see the leads listed uh, below each. So thank you to Lily Zhu for her um, leadership in that uh, space, climate and environmental sciences. Uh, thank you to Jose Ricardo Suarez. Community Health Sciences and Preventive Medicine, thanks to Jill Wallen and uh, Megan Ryan. Our epidemiology lead is Ronnie Salem. Our global health leads will be Holly Baker and Angela Bazzi. In health behavior, we have um, Carrie Botel at the helm. In health policy, uh, Sarah McMenamin. In public mental health, Susie Hong. And in technology and precision health, we have Liz Ike. So I want to take this opportunity to just say thank you um, to those of you who've heard the charge, felt the call, and have decided to um, lead the 
this portion of our school's activities. I also want to thank our program directors for our programs in public health who think and work all the time um, to ensure that our staff are uh, staff needs are getting met as well as our students are, are uh, having their needs met. And I also would like to say thank you to the staff who contribute to these programs in such meaningful ways. So as you can see um, from this kind of summary of our teaching programs, uh, we are doing quite well and it is a really exciting time to, uh, to train and I think also to teach and to work in the school. We have hot off the press, the announcement as of Monday of this week that we have proposed the new PhD program. So the academics who are either on Zoom or in the room will remember this pre being presented at our last uh, meeting, monthly meeting of academics. And we uh, now have had the opportunity to send it through for its first set of reviews. So this PhD in public health is going to be uh, first established as a, con well, we'll have its first concentration established in the space of health services, research, and implementation science. Now, I don't know about all of you, but if I had to go back and do a PhD program, or if I were starting my PhD program now, this is it. This is where it would be for me. Um, and I hear that often when we talk about it with uh, our physician scientists on the campus, or when I mention this, you know, outside of UC San Diego, people are really excited to see us at the forefront of this um, component of training of public health professionals. I say thank you um, to Todd Gilmer and Larry Palinkas and all of you who wrote letters of support, who really helped us think through details, who were in the prior version of the planning group um, for this PhD proposal. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us to get it across the finish line. And so, well, the finish line to review. <laughs> well, I'm sure there'll be more work uh, for us to get it actually into implementation. All right, so that's a quick tour of our teaching activities, our educational programs. I'd like to now talk a little bit about where we are with regards to our research activities. So we are a school that was actually approved by the regents because it was very, very clear how public health could be integrated and could leverage the strengths of the things that already happen on this campus. For example, we have one of the strongest geosciences um, community in the world. We have a hospital as part of our organizational chart. We sit at the border. Um, very few schools um, can say that. And we have already an established group of public health professionals who care deeply and understand that core to public health work is the issue of equity and justice. So I want to share with you now where we are with regards to our research programs. So in our strategic planning process, we came to the conclusion that we should establish uh, these research programs, seven new research programs, to complement the already existing activities that we have in the school. So for example, someone ha may have an independent PI lab, or perhaps they work um, cross collaboratively um, with other PIs in a program project, or perhaps they were already engaged in a center of excellence. Um, we don't want any of those things to necessarily stop, but we wanted our organizational chart and our activities to reflect where it is that we decided to go strategically. That needed to be explicit in our structure, and these um, research programs help us to do that. They have been established in climate and environmental health. Our lead here is Jose Ricardo Suarez. Health equity and global health justice. The lead here is Rebecca Fielding Miller. In healthy aging and longevity science, our lead is Andrea LaCroix. Health services research and health policy, our lead being Eric Grossel. Mental health and substance abuse, our lead is Angela Bazzi. Qualitative methods in public health, our lead is Lily Zhu and women's health and reproductive justice being led by Gretchen Bandley and Andrea LaCroix. So I want to say thank you to our associate and assistant deans for research who really helped us think about how to create the charge, how to ensure that the transitions could happen so that these research programs could get established and um, off the ground. Many of you may have seen the most recent uh, version of Discoveries. I found several copies in my um, mailbox recently. And within that um, 
version, uh, thank you to Yadira and Tyler, we have really nice coverage of the teaching act, some of the teaching activities and research activities in the school. I wanted to just take a moment here to highlight some of our research activities. You'll see that they reflect some new directions as well as some already established directions. So the first one up is um, focused on climate and environmental sciences. And this is this effort, the Espina cohort, is being led by um, Dr. Jose Ricardo Suarez. And Jose is um, conducting a cohort study. It's a study of secondary exposures to pesticides among children and adolescents. It's the largest uh, such study that assesses the effects of pesticide exposure. And most of this work is being done in Ecuador. Um, what's impressive is when uh, Jose Ricardo Suarez started here as an assistant professor, this was the very first grant he submitted. And he uh, now has the status as associate professor, will be leading uh, some of our new school initiatives within this space, and has continued um, to get sustained funding um, via the NIH to support this work. The tremendous impact that this work is going to have um, has yet to be uh, fully elucidated, but it is well on its way um, to telling us a lot that we need to know about pesticide exposure, not only in Ecuador, but across the world. We also um, want to highlight the research that's being done by uh, Holly Baker Shakia on health equity and global health justice. Um, this program is called Aging for All. Um, it ensures agency across um, gender equity issues within um, various parts of the world. It's being funded by USAID to the tune of roughly $35 million, which given the work and the, the um, expansive amount of the globe that this, this work covers doesn't to me seem nearly enough. Um, nonetheless, they continue to promote the voices of local people and to really uh, ensure that the capacity for equity really gets built um, across the, the world. So thank you to um, Holly Baker um, Shakia and her colleagues in global public health for the work that you're doing in this space and also for the exposure and raising the um, this content area within our school. Within the space of healthy aging and longevity science, um, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the work that's being done um, through the lab of Aladdin Shadiab. Um, Aladdin actually was a PhD student in our joint uh, doctoral program, took some time um, away from the academy, and uh, we were so fortunate to have him come back um, to join the faculty several years later. He's been looking at the role of epigenetic aging in risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, every day we all age, but I can tell you as I am firmly solidly in middle adulthood, um, headed into older adulthood, um, the concerns that continue to plague us around um, Alzheimer's disease, cognitive impairment, um, conditions for which touches the lives of so many Americans and for which there are just no solid therapies and the disparities that we see by race, ethnicity are uh, stark. I'm really uh, happy to see Aladdin and his colleagues um, doing work in this space um, because there's so much to be learned and the impact here is gonna be um, quite significant. In the space of health services research, I'd like to highlight the work that's being done um, by Victoria Ojeda, who is a faculty member working on evidence-based approaches serving re-entrants. Now, um, the conversation that many of us have had with each other, with our friends, with other colleagues across the country around the incredible impact of um, discrimination and injustice within our judicial system is at the heart of what this work by um, Victoria Ojeda covers. Uh, she works with a population that um, for many of us, we don't get to interact with on a routine basis. And she has committed um, her, her lab and her life really to ensuring that um, people who have been in touch with the um, judicial system, who have come out of the judicial system, who may you know, go in and out of the judicial system, have um, the opportunity to get the kind of health services that they need. Um, I, I also think that you know, the ability to do this work in a part of San Diego, in a community-based um, 
and engaged and participatory way is to be celebrated in the work that um, Vicki has been doing all of these years. So the UC San Diego Relink program continues to thrive and I think is a really nice example of um, how we show up for community and, and be with community. And in the space of mental health and substance use, I'd like to highlight the work of Eric Lees. And Eric um, has been for his assistant professor Hood, um, characterizing the epidemiology of cannabidol use, CBD use among US adults. He has created the first nationally representative survey of uh, CBD users and the effects of cannabis use at this time in, in history when we understand the policies that have been changing, um, not just here in uh, our state, but really across um, the country and being able to, as uh, good public health practitioners and scientists, really assess exposure um, accurately and in ways that will get information to uh, us for scientific use um, in a respectful and appropriate way uh, with our communities uh, is not to be taken lightly. And so this idea that we have on our faculty, someone who's really leading the charge with how we think about um, having a nationally representative um, approach to, to getting information about CBD use is really quite fantastic. And then um, last but certainly not least, I just wanna highlight the work of um, Armin Schwartzman in quantitative methods in public health. And as Armin has been working in the space of neuropsychiatric conditions, uh, as actually many of our faculty in, in biostatistics and bioinformatics do, and uh, his exciting work is estimating the fraction of variance in, um, in these conditions. And so, you know, similarly, as we, you know, are a school of public health and human longevity um, science, we think about things across the entire lifespan. I, uh, Oftenly, you will hear me say twinkle to wrinkle is the goal. Um, and uh, it's really great to have our colleagues who are uh, quant trained in quantitative methods, biostatistics, bioinformatics, statistics, mathematics, um, really working in these spaces um, because the approaches, as, as we all know, are moving and the methods are changing swiftly from, you know, we used to have small, you know, types of trials. Now we're doing more big data. Um, some people still love the N of ones. I happen to love small data. Um, however, um, we need colleagues like Armin and uh, the teams that uh, work uh, in the space of neuropsychiatric conditions to really uh, help us understand uh, what the, um, variance looks like in these conditions so that we can figure out where to put resources and have public health impact. So as if that, you know, isn't enough um, in the research space, I just want to highlight the fact that we've seen a, um, some growth in our, in our research. And this is hard to quantify on a school level, actually anywhere on the campus. <laughs> it's hard to quantify, but thank you to our business office team, uh, Randy, Heather, and the team in the, in the business office for helping us to understand um, what our indirect return have, have been as a potential proxy or surrogate for how we might be doing in the research space. So you'll see um, from fiscal year 20 forward uh, to now, some growth in our indirect uh, return. We have been getting, we had been getting um, 20% of the total amount of indirects that come back, back into the school. So as you all may know, the ecosystem is such that our school sits in health sciences, health sciences sits on the larger campus. And um, when grants are awarded, they're awarded to the campus. And then right, each entity on the campus uh, shares in the IDC to take care of the various contributions that they make and allow us that allow us to be able to do our work. Uh, starting in fiscal year uh, 2023, thanks again to championing and advocacy um, by our Associate Dean for Business Affairs, Randy Brooks and myself, we have negotiated a 30% return um, to the school, uh, which we think is going to serve us all um, well. We, however, you get a little, you give a little, we will be uh, assessed $180,000 from UCOP um, on our indirects return. And so, uh, 
nonetheless, we're doing really well. And the idea here is that our research portfolio continues to grow. Another signal um, around growth in research might be uh, the number of proposals that get submitted. Uh, we continue to have um, contracts, grants, foundation um, uh, monies. And you see that over the prior two fiscal years, our, our proposal submissions were relatively stable um, at about at 86. And this year we project to be uh, up over 90. So thank you for all of the hard work that you do in this space and we'll continue to keep our eye on it. I'm excited to announce that um, with the establishment of our research programs, we also have with our growing endowment and other um, sources of, of funds, which I'll go over uh, shortly, been able to put together some research pilot grant monies and incentives. And these um, will be discussed more so in depth with all of you as you participate in those strategic research programs. So the first one um, you probably saw the call for not that long ago, it is a collaborative effort with our Center for AIDS Research colleagues. It's a developmental grant. Its goal is to encourage collaboration across our schools. So they're based, the center is actually based in the School of Medicine in the Infectious Disease Group. And this allows for us to have um, co-PIs, one in, in, in our school and one uh, who's a CFAR member. And we're excited about the opportunity to do this great work with them. They have been fantastic um, partners, many of whom are uh, public health trained as well as uh, medical doctors who see the value in what we do and in, in fostering a, a very close and, and sustained partnership with us. We also have... Um, dedicated for each uh, program project uh, and center level grant proposals that are submitted, uh, a certain amount of funds to be shared by PIs of those proposals. So um, we know these things are difficult to do. We find that we're often leaving a lot of money on the table actually, because we can't quite um, get the energy up that we need to put proposals in. And so this will hopefully um, acknowledge the work that that took to get done. Um, and if there needs to be a resubmission, which we all know generally is the case, um, there are monies that will be put forward toward doing the resubmission as well. Um, Pre-approval by the Associate Dean for Research is required um, so that we're in conversation with each other as these uh, proposals go forward. And then starting in uh, fiscal year 24-25, when, when our endowment grows, we're projecting that we're going to have um, some money on, to the tune of about $150,000 a year to support multiple grants of various sizes to, again, generate um, new and, and foster new ideas and collaborations across our research programs or within our research programs. So that's a tour of our research activities. Again, you can see that we're doing um, very well, and it is an exciting time to be doing research in the, in the school. Now, these engines um, around education and around research, they churn and they churn fast and they churn well. And there are a lot of people um, who are at work here. And so I wanna just talk right now about the people of our school, who are they? Um, and our students, when I say students, I mean our current students, I mean our past students, as well as our future students. That's what we think about. We always think about, we have Robert Wood here, one of our MPH graduates, uh, uh, giving me the rah-rah. Um, yeah, we, we, we are really thinking in that broader term when we think about our students all the time, right? All three categories, our staff, our staff are critical to us being able to get our work done. Um, I hope it has become you know, incredibly obvious to uh, those who work in the school, in the research space, in the business space, in some hybrid space, um, that we can get nothing done without the staff. And we acknowledge that. And we are so grateful for all that you all do every day that you come um, to work with us. Uh, academics, um, we know that one of the reasons why you come to a university uh, to work is because you don't mind getting paid a little less and doing a little more. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you, you know, you want to be in a teaching environment, right? You could have your research shop really set up anywhere, but um, you want to be um, with our students and um, with the, the staff. And then of course, the people of, of our, of our school include the communities that we work uh, with. 
So I am very, very happy to share with you that our Bachelor of Science of public health program is the most diverse undergraduate program on the entire campus. Those data have now persisted um, over time. And so I don't think it's a blip um, anymore. This is real. Um, There's something about what we're doing here that is attracting um, people from a variety of walks of life. And it's an exciting um, characteristic of our school that I think it's important to to continue to to hone and ensure that as we have a mission to cultivate new generations of diverse public health professionals, we actually prepare the place for our diverse um, population so that we can be inclusive, truly inclusive um, when we get here. So you see those numbers um, for the BSBH. The MPH program is also um, diverse with regards to uh, female students, BIPOC, and um, underrepresented in health sciences uh, students. Our MS in biostatistics and our PhD in biostatistics continue um, to think about efforts to build and attract uh, um, uh, students, not only getting students into the programs, but also thinking about the type of students that are coming into the program. This has been a commitment on the part of our biostatistics um, leadership and faculty for the entire time that these programs have been um, in conception. And so I look forward to seeing that diversity grow. And I know that um, it will with uh, with the continued efforts that we're going to put there. The joint doctoral program is also um, one that is growing in its diversity and, um, you know, something that we can can be proud of. This is um, not a lot of deans get to stand up and say that they have this kind of diversity within the school. Our preventive medicine residency program also um, is just amazing in um, the kind of the students that they attract, as well as the diversity in, in those students. Now let's look at our staff and academics. Um, We now have um, just over 200 staff in the school. We have over 154 academics. Remember when that number was like 105? Um, We've been growing. Uh, We have 75 uh, faculty with primary appointments and you can see the breakdown for each of those faculty. We welcomed our first teaching professor, uh, Dr. Mara Harrell. Um, Last year, we have 27 faculty with secondary appointments. Um, Those secondary appointments signal something really important. These are faculty who have primary appointments in other schools who have committed to be a part of our teaching mission, right? They're showing up um, in this space, not just because they think the work, the research that we do is exciting. They actually want to um, teach and be a part of our community in other ways. And then we have um, a new community of lecturers. We have uh, our MSP associate physicians, our project and research scientists, our postdoctoral fellows, and our um, visiting scholars. I do want to just um, make a note here of our postdoctoral fellows who often train in either individual PI labs or through our existing T32 uh, educational programs. And so those NIH funded uh, T32 programs, we have three of them. We are a small but mighty uh, community um, to be able to house three T32s in data sciences, in uh, aging, and in cardiovascular disease epidemiology. Um, We have the... um, the potential to impact, right? And train in some strategic spaces. And as we think about what's next with our new PhD proposal, I can see on the horizon us um, having a T32 in that space as well. I wanna um, just highlight the diversity amongst our faculty. And we talked about that diversity amongst our students. Uh, We've got 59% female, 37% BIPOC, and 13% of our faculty are underrepresented in uh, UC uh, Health Sciences. We'll continue to um, grow and prepare for a more diverse faculty as well. We welcomed this year um, five new faculty members. Uh, First was uh, Dr. Chadwick Campbell, who's in the room today. Welcome, Chad. Um, Through our uh, efforts and interests in really thinking more about health equity and um, intersectionality, thinking about um, how we work with the Black diaspora, Um, we are excited to have um, Chad here on the faculty to um, lead, really, in in many of those spaces. we then uh, 
invited and and welcomed Dr. Ramya Rajakapolan, and she works in the space of technology and global health, also committed to health equity and pol uh, policy. Uh, in October, Dr. Lindsay Miller joined us. Um, Lindsay works in the space of epidemiology and community health, as well as uh, chronic diseases and diseases of the aging. In January of 2023, we welcome Steve Waterman, uh, who's also working in the space of epidemiology and global health and has an infectious disease component to his work uh, with doing vector control interventions. And then Annie Nguyen, who came just this month, um, and Annie works in the space of HIV and uh, aging, and she's an epidemiologist. So you'll see growth here in epidemiology, you see growth in health equity. Um, what's really nice about um, this group of faculty is that um, the I think the best hires are the ones that you can't quite figure out exactly where to slot them, right? They really do have this ability to work across the various initiatives that we have um, strategically in the school. And that is certainly the case um, with this group of faculty. Our new faculty files that are in process for hiring, we have um, the following six. We anticipate uh, welcoming Dr. Victor DiGratola in April in Dr. Ann White in June, Dr. Alex Haney in July, along with Carlos Gould, oh. Brian McInnes, and Matt Stone. So um, next year, I'll be uh, including them in the recently hired um, faculty. But yeah, these are the files that are in process. They are very strong. And as you all know, we do all of these files undergo academic review and voting. And so those processes are yet to be completed. You saw, um, as the numbers indicated, some growth that we've already uh, had in uh, this academic year. However, we have um, the desire and capacity to continue to grow. We currently have open searches in health policy. We have a chancellor's joint recruitment uh, with the Department of Medicine's geriatrics group for a geroscience aging uh, expert. That finalist has been identified and we're in the process of um, getting through the final de deal there. Uh, we have a general adjunct faculty member um, search that is ongoing and our unit eight lecturer search is also ongoing. On the horizon, um, you'll see that we, I think we'll only strengthen what we do in the school through some upcoming hires that allow us to be jointly connected with some other department um, schools on the campus. So we've got a chancellor's joint hire coming up with the Rady School of Management. Um, Dean Ordonez is incredibly excited about doing this with us. It'll uh, support our faculty in health services research and, and healthcare management. We have a joint recruitment that's going on with the Alzheimer's disease um, uh, clinical st studies group. And that's gonna be focused on uh, neurosciences, but someone who also is a biostatistician will be um, recruited via that avenue. And we'll be resuming our advancing faculty diversity higher. Um, that'll allow us to grow our faculty in health equity, public health, and um, those who focus on the black diaspora. Along the lines of bringing in faculty, we wanna think about how do we support faculty? And our associate uh, dean and assistant dean for faculty affairs, uh, Dr. Susie Hong and Dr. Dennis Trinidad have been working with our associate and assistant dean for academic affairs, uh, Dr. Todd Gilmer and Dr. Cinnamon Bloss to think about how do we ensure that when you get here um, as a new faculty member, you have the ability to thrive here. And so we've created these mentoring pods. They are in an effort to improve the faculty experience. They actually didn't just come out of thin air. Um, it was part of our strategic planning process discussions, but there were also some needs assessment and surveys done to try to understand what, is, what it is that our early career faculty are in need of. And these 12 pods were formed um, in response to what we heard uh, during those those listening sessions. Well, our staff um, also uh, have opportunities within the school for uh, support toward their success. And during our strategic planning process, we heard from the staff that they would like to have more diversity, wanna ensure there's good solid mentoring and professional development activities 
the opportunity to advance in their career and to know uh, when and how um, they can do that. And then, you know, we're all committed um, to working in a climate that is inclusive and is respectful and is just. And so um, we are now in a place where I can't stop smiling every time I um, talk about this. We have a Dean's Advisory Committee on Staff Affairs, and we are the only school actually on this campus that has one of these. It's the opportunity to liaise um, with the Dean's Office. Um, prior to establishing DOXA, we, um, I, my office would meet with the staff quarterly. Um, they have, of course, other meetings that happen within their respective divisions, but it was an opportunity to have this bi-directional um, conversation, um, letting staff know what's going on in the school and uh, hearing from them what, where their concerns may be and what um, ideas they may have to contribute to some of the things that we're doing um, because our staff really are quite bright. The DOXA was formed by self-nomination and then there was an election process and they had their first meeting in the summer of last year. They have a bylaws and um, a governance structure. They are, are now focusing on three key issues. Um, there are lots of things to do, uh, but they've prioritized hiring and retention of diverse staff, equitable pay and a standardized exit interview so that we can really think about what's happening when attrition occurs and how we can better work to retain um, people who really want to be here. And we've got um, an established email and other methods for anonymous communication with the DOXA so that people can hopefully feel free to really communicate what they're thinking. And they will give feedback uh, to the D and me um, at quarterly uh, staff meetings. So this is a really uh, great endeavor and thank you so much to our uh, staff chairs of, of the DOXA committee and the entire committee. We have uh, a lot to think about when it comes to our students. Um, you all know that this next generation of trainees are looking for things that are different um, than what our current and typical uh, university settings often provide. And so we are gonna need to grow our staff to support having new initiatives for our students. They are in need of career and um, career development, career exploration, mentoring, advising uh, in these spaces, help with job placement, um, a sense of belonging um, to the school and really having their basic needs met. Um, you all may remember a while back, um, I shared a story of covering food insecurity as a topic in uh, the Foundations of Public Health course and having a student confide in me um, that they were sleeping in their car, um, had no real access to, to food, et cetera. Um, through that class's efforts, uh, while we were teaching in that term, the Andy's Pantry was established and um, the pandemic came. We had to close down all activities. What was nice about the pantry was that anyone could take advantage of it and foods were delivered um, to whatever address was provided. It also did force the conversation though about why is it that our students are food insecure um, with regards to uh, the price of housing in this town um, at this school, right? There are other factors that are happening that really squeeze our, our students into these, these um, impossible spaces of, of need. And so I just want you all to know that the school is in the process of trying to figure out, you know, where do we start and how do we prioritize and how do we support um, the needs of our students? And we work um, very closely with our program directors, as well as our um, student affairs officers to uh, do all of the things that we can do to make things better. Now I wanna shift uh, gears a little bit to talk about the finances of the school. So I think it helps to just kind of know the bottom line, right? Um, bluff, bottom line up front. I just learned that term the other day. So here's the bottom line up front. The school's in its early days, we've got limited resources, right? This is not always going to be the case. Uh, however, we're careful to operate within this, these constraints and we maintain a minimally positive annual operation budget. Our resources are gonna grow and as they grow, we're gonna be able to increase the support that we provide to those strategic initiatives that we all outline. 
We have a lot to do in the space of uh, student support. We have a lot to do in the space of staff support, our academics, um, really thinking about how do we ensure that you know, all of us, um, no matter what appointment type you have when you come into the school, uh, have a chance to feel supported. And in moments in our career, which I think all of us are um, likely to experience at some point, if there is a bridge that needs to be built, this is a school that can uh, help to build that bridge. But let's look at a bit more of the specifics. So, gosh, I remember five or six years ago as a department, we had three sources of revenue. Um, our sources of revenue have gone up a bit. Uh, we now have, as we always had, our indirects that get returned um, to the school. And this comes in from grants, service agreements, from um, re recharge cores. We, uh, the members of the school who hold FTE um, appointments, cost share on those FTEs and contribute back to the school uh, some of the uh, monies that are allocated um, in that space. We, Randy and I, um, on a routine basis, we negotiate, right? We negotiate with the vice chancellor for health sciences and the chancellor for um, intramural funding for the school. We have um, contributions that um, people make um, when they get research gifts. So to support the indirect efforts that we need to put forward um, for those gifts. We have within the school, the Wertheim Endowment. Um, we have the Hood Endowment. I think it's worth talking a little bit about the Wertheim Endowment and how it's structured, particularly for those of you who are new to the school and wonder why the Dean says no sometimes. Um, that gift agreement is set up as six separate endowments. It's going to increase over 13 years to a $25 million principal. However, um, the current principal um, is at seven and a half, roughly million dollars. The current annual payout is at about three hundred thousand um, dollars. We put into our general use funds about one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars of that. The Master of Public Health and the MS in Biostatistics, they will, after they're out of their startup phase, contribute um, to the school um, in terms of our revenue. And then we are so incredibly blessed um, to have many of you, members of the school, who generously donate to us at their philanthropic gifts. Um, we have philanthropic gifts from our alumni, and I, um, as your dean, continue to pursue philanthropic gifts from those who have way more money than um, they can see themselves spending um, throughout their lifetime and who really do want to give it to great causes. Now, how do we use um, this revenue? Well, um, every a uh, person who doesn't have an FTE, every faculty member um, gets 3% uh, salary support. This is not uniform or common across all of health sciences, but we remain committed uh, to providing this uh, support. We use it for administration. Um, we pay into the shared sources, shared resources that are available through health sciences, which take care of um, academic review, uh, HR, IT, research uh, uh, services. And then we have general operational costs that are um, associated with the day-to-day -day, um, running of the place. We have pension expenses. We pay, of course, our tax to the office of the president. And then we try to have a little fun in the place, right? We've got school events. Um, we pay for speakers. We have parties. And now that we are coming back into um a time in history where we can interact with each other um, more, um, those contributions are gonna go up a little bit. And then you've heard me talk about strategic initiatives, including the pilot um, grants and incentives that we've put forward. So that's a tour of our um, financial status, which again, I think is strong and um, is uh, in a space of, or, or a place where we can grow it. Then I want to talk about what is probably the special sauce of the Her Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity Science, and it's our community and our collaborative spirit. You know, I went through my um, cell phone, which I sometimes do to remind myself where I've been um, over time, and I pulled out these photos and I'm not one to take a lot of photos, but every now and then I sit in a space and I reflect on how grateful I am to be able to do the kind of work that I do and to be with the kind of people that I'm with. And so um, 
some of these photos here reflect um, those moments over the last year or so um, where I just thought, wow, um, this is a really amazing feature of UC San Diego. Um, you'll see kind of center screen, a bunch of us in t-shirts. That's the COVID monitoring team. Um, for two and a quarter years, we met every single day of the year, weekends, holidays, all of it. Um, and I got to know um, these individuals really, really well. Angela Song, Chip Schooley, Angela um, Sosha, Allison Satterland, and Natasha Martin. It didn't help that three of them have ASs as their initials when, you know, <laughs> you try to get to them on, on text. But, um, you know, this, 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 um, is is just a, a fantastic um, part of, of who we are at the School of Public Health is we in, interact with each other, I think in really special and unique and respectful and um, beautiful ways. We interact with our colleagues across the campus um, similarly. And I am really looking forward to what our associate and assistant deans of the public health um, academic and community partnerships will do to help us um, in the space of our public health practice units and how we unveil those units. Another feature of our community is our Compassionate Action Circle. And this is um, one of the activities that was established uh, by our Jedi and um, colleagues um, who started really pretty much thinking about it during the strategic planning phase and the entire committee has um, stayed together and continued to offer some really nice programming. But the Compassionate Action Circle uh, is a school-wide gathering all are invited to really foster communication and dialogue on um, you know, issues that are related to, to culture, that are related to diversity, that are related to inclusion, um, things that are coming up on the national scene, on the global scene, on our local scene. And we uh, so far have had some really amazing um, gatherings. Yesterday was one of them where we talked about one year later, um, what was the reflecting a bit on, on uh, Ms. Isabel Wilkerson's visit with us. Um, Ellen Beck facilitated that. Um, co she and I co-facilitated it. Um, and um, I say Ellen facilitated it because she's so phenomenal. Um, but we are uh, continuing to think about topics that are relevant and interesting for this community that will help us to grow and that will help build trust and community. We also have been um, protecting um, the, the space within within our, our our work to do the quarterly service activities of the school, and so um, you may remember when we were all working remotely, um, we had um, an opportunity to participate in Mama's Kitchen's um, Thanksgiving activities, where um, we, as a school, um, put forward um, some. Um, some contributions to uh, ensuring that those who are medically insecure in our community can have meals. Um, we've had um, other activities with the VA. We've had um, activities where we've written letters to, to uh, soldiers. Um, we are now a routine uh, partner with the San Diego Blood Bank. Um, we had one, our very first quarterly activity with the blood bank, and it was so wildly successful. Um, they said that no other um, group on the campus ever had that kind of turnout. In, in fact, I think so many people showed up that we weren't able to get it all done in that day. And so we have um, now um, established a pattern of having them come um, routinely. We are um, also working to improve our communications. We have uh, had Yadira Galindo with us for a while, but we welcomed uh, a new representative, uh, Tyler, to our, our team. And you'll continue to see their stamp on communications like the week ahead. Um, and we also try um, to be inclusive of our staff and our students with the things that we um, communicate. And I'll go a little deeper shortly. But when um, the staff surveys came in in 2017. One of the things that I read in those surveys was that they felt disconnected from the mission of the place. And so we put in place the, I, the practice of sending to staff 
the minutes and the agenda from all meeting of academics. Uh, and so um, that's happening in addition to the quarterly all staff meetings um, to keep our staff um, apprised of what is happening in the mission. And we also um, are listening to our staff to hear um, about their contributions to our strategic directions. Um, we also uh, continue to try to use Slack um, where it makes sense. Um, we have a Twitter um, feed for the school and we have an Instagram uh, profile for the school as well. And then, of course, um, we try to bring our community, our larger community from across the campus or across the community in um, to our spaces. Um, we, I can envision going out of this space and into community um, soon. Uh, we need to do a little bit of talking and listening uh, before we can figure out how that happens. But our Public Health Research Day continues to be really well uh, subscribed and just a lot of fun. Um, and uh, thank you to those of you who organize it. Uh, I know Loki, you're doing it this year with a massive team. And our commencement celebration is another time when we bring people in, um, as well as our welcome event that happens in the fall to uh, say hello and um, that we're happy to see our students who are coming back to join us. We have had um, a priority list of partners um, in this, the school since we opened the doors. It turns out um, we couldn't get every single partner that we have established either through our research or through our education mission onto any um, you know, slide that I could put together. And we also knew that as a new school, we couldn't do everything. We had to start somewhere. And so in the space of public health service and public health practice, um, we decided that our internal campus partners that would be prioritized in the early years of the school would be the Center for AIDS Research, CIFAR. And you've already heard about um, pilot funds and grant opportunities and work that we're doing with CIFAR. The Office of Research Affairs, the EDI office across the campus and the Health Sciences Office of Faculty Affairs. We have um, Vivian Resnick on our uh, faculty in the room has been a um, great champion of faculty and early career. I know I personally benefited from that office when I first came um, to UC San Diego and we continue to you know, listen, collaborate, um, really leverage a lot of what happens in, um, faculty, in the Office of Faculty Affairs. Our external community partners, include the Live Well San Diego initiative. Um, we received from Live Well San Diego in our very um, early years as a school, a recognition for being a champion um, for community health um, through the efforts that were put together um, through our contact tracing group. Um, so Robert Wood, our director for contact tracing um, is here in the room with us. And that um, was a really nice signal that, you know, we as the School of Public Health, new kids on the block, really want to be present in community and do things that were not possible before, right? We are um, there to really help advance the things that our, our partners have on their minds. The Imperial County Health Services um, are another selected partner. We've written a grant with them. Um, it wasn't funded, but we continue those conversations to think about how um, do we increase resources and representation in Imperial County. Um, the Tijuana Estuary, um, we are um, is thinking about establishing a neighborhood health program. I champion that thing everywhere that I go. Um, it's um, the, city, the, the town of Imperial Beach, which is heavily connected to the Tijuana Estuary. And um, so we'll continue to uh, work with those partners. We've had for decades our teaching relationship with San Diego State University. And we also have um, NIH grants and other uh, collaborative efforts that we do with San Diego State. The Naval Health Research Center, they have been amazing partners. Our students um, and our faculty um, have longstanding relationships um, and we continue to pursue those. And then the San Diego Rapid Response Network. We, as I mentioned before, have established quarterly service activities. And the whole goal here is to take a minute to pause, right? During any quarter of the year to just reflect on what needs there are within the community and how we as individuals and as a larger group can contribute to those needs. And so um, this is something that we've been really careful to do within the workday 
slash school day. Um, because when things are important, we shouldn't necessarily push them into the margins, right? And so again, Mama's Kitchen, the Blood Bank, and VA San Diego have been a part of our quarterly service partners. We do all that we do, and I worry constantly about do I know enough about what you all are thinking? And do you know enough about what is being done? So communications is something that we are trying to refine uh, within the school. Uh, recently, the associate deans and assistant deans and I, along with our communications team, sat down and talked about how are we doing in this space? And here's the state of our communication strategy. So we have things that we do at various frequencies within the school. So you can imagine, right, there are things that are happening daily, and then there are communications that we're doing um, weekly, monthly, quarterly, things like this annually, and then there's special needs and ad hoc needs. And on a daily basis, you can imagine we need to create community, right? So we need to be in, in conversation with each other, facilitate our work, facilitate relationships amongst us, um, share our work, um, think about increasing our visibility and our impact. And so we do that through the methods that you see here, email, intranet, uh, social media, our news releases, Slack, Teams, websites. Um, then when it comes to, but I don't think we want to do much more <laughs> on a daily basis, right? We all have a lot of work to do. Um, but once a week, uh, you get in your box the week ahead and the associate and assistant dean's team, we all meet together to talk through the issues of the school. Here, we're thinking about strategic planning, holding ourselves accountable, really making sure that anything that's happening um, at the school or across the campus has been, um, thank you, Kimberly, has been, um, has been put on the table. And then monthly, we have our meeting of faculty and academics, the Committee on Education Policy meets, the Dean's Advisory Committee on Staff Affairs meets, and then their office hours with assistant and associate deans. This um, group of activities really are there to communicate out things that are either going to happen or have already happened, and for us to listen to, uh, to what requests, suggestions, ideas you might have. So there's really this intentionality around bi-directional communication. Uh, quarterly, we have the all staff meeting with the Dean, the Compassionate Action Circle. Uh, mentoring pods have been asked to meet at a minimum quarterly, but they may end up meeting more. And here we're talking about engaging people, right? Making sure that we center our JEDI mission and that we're transparent around how we're using resources and what people, um, what people need. Annually, we do a couple of things. We put the annual report together, and by we, I mean the great Yadira Galindo, um, the state of the school address, public health research day, we have a back to school reception, we celebrate our graduates, we recognize our faculty and academics, we have um, a staff retreat that will be resumed now that we're um, able to, to come into community. Um, and we know how to do that safely. We're gonna put in place a retreat of the leads of the teaching divisions and the research program leads, as well as the public health practice leads. And you know, here we're really thinking about continuous improvement, right? How do we take that space to reflect and think about what we have done and what we can do better? And also to celebrate, um, we don't, don't do that often enough. And then special communications. Sometimes there's an urgent thing, right? We experience the the strike and the UAW negotiations, um, and you might find that there's a, a dean's email that you get, um, or we pull everybody together in a school wide forum because we need to have discussion around whether it's our strategic plan or some component of it or some tragedy, um, um, or there's something that we need feedback on. And then community town halls. And then there's, there are things that don't quite fit into any real frequency. They just happen when they need to happen ad hoc, like office hours. Um, again, these are spaces where particularly the associate and assistant deans create. Uh, I have them as well, um, where people can just come in and we're there to listen and, and hear what's on your mind. 
Our teaching divisions will meet as they see appropriate. The minimum request is once a year. The research programs will also meet as um, they see appropriate. And the public health practice units are actually currently being created. And we will um, come up with a, a meeting frequency there. And of course, our students, they have clubs, they have uh, their own um, career services, uh, seminars, et cetera, um, that are going on in the life of the school. But I just thought it was important to share with you um, we are thinking about this and we want to do this well and we want to do it better. So if you have ideas, uh, please do reach out and share them. And with that, I want to just do a really quick tour of thank yous. Um, I want to say thank you to our program coordinators who help us um, with our education mission, as well as our program directors. I see many of your uh, wonderful faces here in the room this afternoon. I want to say thank you to the associate deans and the assistant deans who work tirelessly um, to support um, all that we do in the space of education, research, public health practice, our JEDI mission, academic affairs, faculty affairs and mentoring, and business affairs. I want to say thank you to this community who continues to show up for each other. Um, we continue to um, spread the good work that we're doing. Um, we'll, you'll see that we're really well celebrated in media and, and other um, press clips. We have had some great wins. Our UC San Diego accountability report, which looks at how we're doing in the space of equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, got the best uh, rating of all of the schools on the campus. Um, we have had the CDC ambassadors program. We were selected to host that here. It's a pipeline building program that the CDC uh, sponsors. And uh, we, we were just so um, honored to be able to do that in collaboration with them. I've already talked about our Live Well San Diego um, award. We also got an award from the mayor's office called Loyal to the Soil um, for the efforts that we put forward during the pandemic. And so I um, remain really excited about our visibility and um, think that we're going to just raise the profile of the school even more in the coming year. I would like, want to again just say thank you to our lead donors. You see them um, pictured here on the screen, the Wertheims and the Hood family. Um, and then to all of you for, you know, all that you've been doing during a really difficult time um, for the school. We've had, by difficult, I mean, um, we, we started in a pandemic. Um, but that doesn't scare us, right? Some of the great schools started 100 years ago during the influenza pandemic. And so we're in good company. Um, we also have been noticing growing trends around mental illness and people come into this school um, with existing mental um, illness. We also are, I think, responsible for creating an environment of wellness and resilience. And so um, I thank you all for, for all that you do as we think through these these issues. We also have, as summarized here, a big task ahead of us um, with regards to our strategic planning activities. However, um, I want to reassure you that as we delve into um, these various uh, components, we are going to be monitoring and evaluating the work that we do. And so lots of change will be happening, but we'll also be um, keeping an eye on that change to ensure that we know when we need to uh, adjust and we can uh, even disband things if they don't work well. So all of that said, I just want to reiterate that, you know, I think we're in a great place. Um, we are going to be even greater because we're going to position ourselves to understand what the threats are to our school community and to do something about it. And you've heard me say before, I strongly believe that good schools don't just teach people, they change people. And so I look forward to doing this work with you as we advance well-being and social justice for all through public health innovation, education, and service. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And the floor is now open for questions. <laughs>